this series in the, in the month of September entitled, I Quit. I Quit. And, and I know when, that, when, when, when the title came, I was like, this is going to trip us out because all of our life we've been told never give up, never walk away, and never quit. But there comes a point in time that some things in your life that aren't bearing the fruit that you're desiring and the fruit, watch this, that God intended, you need to let it go. You simply need to quit. Amen. And we looked at it. We looked at it the first week. We looked at, uh, uh, we talked about that you need to quit lying to yourself. Because a whole, of, a whole lot of us spend a lot of time lying to ourselves. We know that it's not the truth. We know it's not the best thing to do. We know they're not the best decisions to make. We know that they're not the best places to be. And we convince ourselves to do it, say it, or go there anyway. Quit lying. Secondly, last week we talked about the spirit of procrastination. We told you, stop procrastinating. Stop putting off what God has commanded you to do. Woo. Stop living unfruitful life when God said that you ought to be bearing fruit and that your fruit should be remaining. Amen, somebody. So this week I want to talk to you about this. I, 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 want, you, I want you to quit denying God with your thoughts. I, I want you to take that off that motion background, please, son, and just... Just put it on something black, put, yeah, something dark. I think I made it on black. So yeah, that's good. That's good. I want you to quit denying God with your thoughts. So let's get our text scripture. If you have your phones, your Bible, uh, you, you can go right along with us. We're, we're, we, we found this text scripture in the book of Matthew. In the book of Matthew, the 10th chapter, um, the 32nd verse, 32nd and 30 verse, third verses read like this. So everyone who acknowledges me before man, I will also acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But, everybody say but. Whoever denies me before man, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. So God, Jesus, this is Jesus talking. If you check it out in your Bible, it should be in red. This is Jesus talking. He's talking and he makes a statement. He makes a very specific statement that you got to get a revelation from. He says this, if you acknowledge me before man, I'll acknowledge you before the Father. But if you deny me before man, I have to deny you before the Father. Now here's the funny thing is that when I kept looking at this, I was like, Jesus going to deny me. In all actuality, he doesn't. You deny yourself. Hmm. Get with it. Think, think, think about it. If I refuse to accept, to relinquish, that I can move in what he's calling me to, I'm automatically denying what he set up for me. Are, are you with me? There, there, there's a text in the Bible that says, if you resist the devil, what? He'll flee from you. Well, this is the same principle. If you resist God, you can't benefit from God. So Jesus says, if you deny me, then you automatically are resisting me and there's no way I can acknowledge you because you're resisting me. Y'all all right? Y'all give me them, 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 them faces, them faces. So here's the thing. We, we've gotten into this thing where we are constantly denying God. And all of us would be like, I don't deny God. I believe, I believe in God. I, God, I love God. Because y'all, you know, the ladies say, you don't love God? What's wrong with it? Yeah, 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 yeah. So all of us, watch this, believe we love God. And, and all of us be believe that we belong to God. And all of us believe that God loved this. And this is what I found out, is that many of us believe in God. But not all of us believe God. Many of us believe in God. We've acknowledged that there is a God, but we don't believe God because we don't accept his word and his will as our truth. There is a difference. There is a difference. There is a difference. And, and here's the thing about it. You got a right to believe or not to believe in God. But I want you to know that it's your right to be right, oh, boy, it's your right to be right that's causing you to miss God. 
You Facebook that. It, it, it's your right. It's your right. It's your right to be right. Or better yet, it's your right to be right that's causing you to miss his righteousness. And everything that God intends for us flows through his righteousness concerning us. Amen. So I got a right to be right, but my right to be right is causing me to miss his righteousness. And because of that, watch this, because I'm determined to be right, I miss the opportunity to be righteous, and I never live at the level that God has obtained or, 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 or intended for me. So I want us to quit. I want you to quit. I want you to quit denying God with your thoughts. Quit denying God with your thought life. Your thought life controls everything about you. So, so watch this. The word deny means this. It says it's to state that something declared or believed to be true is not true. That, that, that about said in a nutshell, ain't it? It says to refuse to agree, to deny access, to withhold something from, to refuse to grant a request, to refuse to recognize or what? Acknowledge. So when we deny with our thoughts, what we're doing is we're refusing to acknowledge God as God and to recognize the will of God, the word of God, is better than what our own personal will and desires are for ourselves. Tell somebody, quit it. Yeah, 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 y'all real quiet. So maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that's a hmm thing. We had some hmm moments. And ain't nothing wrong with that. So, so we have to stop denying God with what? Our thoughts. How do I do it? I got to start acknowledging his word as my truth, as the greater truth. I got I to allow God's word to shape how I think. I, I even have to allow God's words to shape how I feel. All right, we're we going to look at it. We're going to look at it. We're going to look at it because I, I feel y'all. So let's, let's look at this. Many of us determine what's right, what's righteous for us based upon what we think. Based upon what we think. Based upon what we think. How you think, what? Governs what you do. The kingdom of a man, the mind of a man governs his decision making, his choices, his processes, his emotions are attached to how he thinks. And how you think sometimes is what? Is the evidence of how you feel. So there is a connection between how I feel and how I think and how I think and how I feel. I can think myself happy or I can think myself depressed. I can feel depressed and it changes how I think. Or I can change how I think and change how I feel. Are y'all with me? I said, are you with me? I said, are you with me? All right. Mm. <laughs> Stop yelling at me. So watch, the word think, look at this, to have a conscious mind, to exert, uh, to, to exert what, some uh, of reasoning. So here's what I want you to get. When you think you are remembering experiences that shape how you make your rational decisions. All right, that, that's powerful. And you got to grasp that. When you think, when you're thinking, it, it, it says that you start to remember experiences that do what? They, they, they shape how you make your decisions. So your experiences, what you remember now shapes how you process and how you make your choices. So if, if, if I, oh boy, if I had a bad experience, it's always going to impact how I think. Oh, uh, okay, because Let's, let's, let's take it a little deeper and get a little personal with it. It's a whole bunch of people in here that's had some people that mistreat them in a relationship, and after they did, your, 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 your remark was this, I ain't going to never let nobody say, I, I can't hear you, I ain't going to never let nobody. So what, watch this, now that failed thought or that failed relationship now impacts how you think about every relationship you will enter into from that point on. And Mr. Right will show up and you will treat him wrong based upon the experience that you had with Mr. Wrong. 
And all y'all praying, all the single women praying for Boaz to show up. And then when he do, you don't know how to treat him because you still thinking about how broke. If Pastor Karen was here, you know, she'd get to cuss in church. <laughs> His cousin broke, you know, who uh, treated you. So now you respond to Boaz the same way you did to Bozo. We're going to clean it up. And Boaz ain't did nothing to you. He trying to get something to you. But you keep treating him like he was Bozo that was trying to rip you off of your goodies. Oh, I'm preaching good and, and talking clean today. This is PG teaching. <laughs> so, so watch this. I, I cannot allow the, the experiences to be the thing that shape how I make my decisions from this point on. Okay? So watch this. Here's what I want you to get. Get this. Make a mental note. My experiences evoke my emotions. My emotions affect, affect my thoughts. My experiences evoke my emotions, and my emotions affect, affect my thoughts. Oh, trying to figure out this new screen, so I get I made it too big. So y'all had to take my word for it that is on my paper. <laughs> so watch. My experience is what? They pull my, thank you. My experience is vote my emotions. They pull my, based upon what I experienced, it, 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 I respond to it out of one of my five senses, out of my emotions. There is an emotional response to an experience. But that experience now, watch this, my emotions now begin to have an effect or an effect based upon what? happen is how I respond to it. So there is an effect of the experience that is that 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 affects my affections or how I respond to that experience. Amen. So there and all of this does what? It shapes the way I think. So it shapes my thought process. So now when something happens and I blame it on God, because mm, we always do <laughs> Even though the Bible tells us every good and perfect gift comes from above, it, it does not matter. When it happens, there's an emotional response that shapes the way I think, and it shapes how I respond. It shapes how I feel. It, it, it shapes, you know, what it, what, it, what, what it evokes me to do. So sometimes I become stagnated simply based upon what I'm thinking. And I begin to deny the power of God in my life simply based upon how an experience has caused me to think. Are y'all with me? So, now watch, watch. You were never created to function in a thought independent of God, but in express revelations of God. You were never created to function in a thought that's independent of God. Are, are you with me? So watch, watch. Let's, Genesis 1.26 tells us that, in the, that God made us in his image and in his likeness. In his image and in his likeness. God made us out of his imagination. God calls us forth and he creates us to function as he does. So God didn't make us independent of his thought. We started as a thought of God. Are you with me? We started as God's thought. You are an express, creative, functioning thought of God. You were created and given the, uh, the ability to function and flow in the mind of God. That, that's why, oh man, in, in Genesis 2, in Genesis 2 and 7, it starts talking about it starts talking about God breathed breath into man and man became a living functioning what's his soul in the soul of a man is where his mind, his emotions, his feeling, his thinking and his processes is. So he said he breathed into man God's ability to function, to process, to think, to respond in the same manner that God would. You weren't created to do your own thing. You were created to do a God thing. And the problem is, we've now, Genesis 3, we get to, there's another voice being introduced in the garden that starts to tell us, you can think on your own. You can look at what God said is bad and not to touch, and you can declare within yourself that it's okay for me to do this. 
Are, are you with me? And when they started to function in the independent thought, the independent thought took them to a place that they never want to be. Have you ever stopped and looked at your life and realized that every time I got somewhere jacked up, it won't God leading me, it was me? And then you still think you smart enough to make your own decision. One day we're going to realize, absent from God, we dumb. There's a reason he called you sheep. No, I ain't, I'm not trying to be funny. Sheep follow. Sheep, come on, man. Sheep, sheep simply do what? They follow. Why? Because they say the, the function, the size of a sheep's brain, don't give them the ability to process to make, oh, boy. So <laughs> I wasn't created, oh, man, y'all don't like this. I, I, I wasn't created to function outside of the leadership of God. Come on, man. Come on. He leadeth me. Come on, come on. Look what David said. He leadeth me. All my job was to do was to follow where? Where he was leading me. Why? Because he was going to take me to the still waters beside. Come on, come on, come on. Y'all, y'all ready? The green pastures, the still waters. It, it said, wherever he lead me, I was going to be all right. Even in the presence of my enemy. I was going to what? Be all right. Why? Because when the shepherd, when the sheep was with the shepherd, he said, the ra- the, my, your rod and your staff, they would comfort me. You would prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemy. You would anoint my head with oil and it would cause my cup to run over. Goodness and mercy would follow me as long as I followed you. And the reason some of us jacked up is because we think we could do it better than God. Ooh, Jesus. Mm, yeah, I'm all right now. I'm all right now. You, you, oh boy. That's the reason why stuff don't happen. That's the reason why people always talking about church. Because church folks always talking about doing something and then don't never do a doggone thing but talk about doing something. Why? Because you got your own vision. You got your own mission statement. And it's apart from what God created or Jesus birthed the church to do. He called a gathering, not a building. And now watch this, we got more respect for the building than we do for the people that come into the building. And now we done made our pastors into idol gods. Yeah. And, and we, y'all, done, y'all done got us so jacked up that we think we too good to hang around y'all. Oh, man. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to get booed on YouTube on this one. But it's all right. Watch this. We didn't got so jacked up as being pastors that we forgot we supposed to smell sheepy. Jesus never stopped commingling with the people. He never set himself apart. Matter of fact, he, as much as he could, he found himself where? Around the people. And if he was around the people and they were stinking, guess what? He was. But not, we didn't not today because y'all done made us high and mighty. That's why we got bigger seats than y'all. Man, we got to be careful because real quick you slip over and be in an idol. And you become idol worshipers. Oh. Somebody say stop, Pastor. So watch this. I, I got to get your minds right. I got to get, your- get your minds right. Because the devil is trying to tell you, you can do it on your own and you can think it the way you think it and make it all right. Listen, just because you call it right, don't make it righteous. Look, look, at, look, look at 1 Corinthians. Look, look at 1 Corinthians um, uh, 6 and 12. This is what it says. Paul writes this. Paul says, out of the, and, and this is out of the English uh, version standard of the Bible. It, it, it says this. Paul says, all things are lawful for me. All things are lawful for me. I can make all things lawful, but not all things are helpful. Mm. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Paul says all things are what? Lawful. I can find a right or I can find my right to do it in anything that I make up my mind to what? To do. Ain't that how we live? And the house went silent. I'm not raising my hand on that one. Even now, as much as I say I love God, I find myself at times wanting to have, watch this, an independent thought. 
Because there are some things that we enjoy that God has declared to be just, just, just like in, in the garden, that tree that he told them not to touch. There are some things that God has told us not to touch, but tell you the truth is we enjoy touching them. And because we enjoy touching them, and Paul declares that we can declare all things to be righteous, we find a way to make our wrongs. Yeah. Wow. Well, yeah, we just justify them. And then tell somebody what? Don't judge me. Well, if you break the law, you... no, for real, if you break the law, you end up in front of the, and the judge. So how are you going to tell somebody don't judge you when you're breaking the law? How else do we get you corrected if somebody does not judge your behavior to find it to be what? Incorrect, poor. Not what God intended for you. We don't judge you to condemnation. We judge you to what? To a righteousness. Are y'all with me? So, so, so somebody, you got to allow somebody to have an authority in your life. You got to humble and submit yourself to somebody's authority that they can walk up into you and tell you that's wrong. But now if you tell somebody they're wrong, they, they immediately become offended. I, I don't understand that. If it's the truth, how do you get offended? Because I told you the truth. When you talk talking about something, well, yeah, I can handle the truth. That movie, that man said, you can't handle the truth. And many of us can't. We, that's why we don't even, for real, we don't even pray and ask God to show us the truth. Because we're too busy in enjoying our wrong. And I can justify my wrong. And then I, I can always find somebody that will agree with my wrong. And, and call them my friend, but your friends, they were really your friend, they would tell you the, and if your friend called you out and tell you the truth, then you talk about them and say they ain't your friend, no. Because <laughs> they simply told you the truth. We don't want the truth, we just want to feel good. And now that's the same, that's the same premise, that's the same ideology that we bring in church. If a pastor get up and start talking about correction and rebuking you, you can leave that church and go to the church around the street where all they tell you is everything is all right. As long as you give your money, you can do what you want to do. Devil is a lie. If God says it's wrong in his word, there's nothing you can do to make it right. If he tells you to abstain from a thing, then I don't care how much perfume you put on it. You know, yeah, I can say this in church. Dog duty still stinks even if you wipe it off your shoe. Yeah, because you can wipe it off. But if you in that house and that thing start kicking up, you know somebody, and, and then you start looking around to find out who done stepped in something. <laughs> Cause and watch this, sin still stink, even when we can't. Oh boy, oh boy. So you can try to hide it, you can try to dress it up, cause we dress up sin real good. You can try to church it up, but the truth is, to the nostrils of God, it still stinks. It's still sin. Nothing changes. That's mine, that's yours, that's the person in front of you, and the person behind you. It doesn't even matter what type of sin you're living in, it stinks in the nostrils of God. Mm. So here, watch this. Take me to Romans 8. Watch this. So let, let, let's get through some stuff here, man. Now, now, now I want to go there. Yeah, yeah we're going to be here. One more time. Okay, almost. So there, Romans 8 and 1. This, Therefore there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Come on. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit gives life, has set you free from the law of sin and death. So watch this. Oh, come on, come on, come on. I don't want to stop. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by what? By flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. So he condemned sin where? Where is sin condemned? So when I, whenever I start acting out of my flesh, nine times out of ten, I'm going to end up in sin. Because why? Because sin has been what? 
in the flesh. It has been sealed. It's condoned. It, watch this. That's why in your flesh you can make anything all right. If, if you would hold your finger right there, don't move, Ty. And if you had your Bible, you can flip over to Romans 1, right around that 21st verse, and it starts talking about you, you didn't made the truth. You have turned the truth into a lie. Why? To satisfy yourself. So, so don't, <laughs> it don't matter how many times a month you show up here. If you ain't living the truth out of the spirit, then nine times out of ten, you live in the lie out of your flesh. And, and you got to understand that every time you start processing out of your kernel, you're denying the kingdom of God the opportunity to work in you. And then you miss what God has intended for you. And then you turn around and blame God for not blessing you when God is constantly trying to get a blessing to you. But you keep processing out of the weakest part of you. The only reason the law failed is because it was dependent upon the weakened flesh. The weakest part of you is you. And then you... You with your smart self, because that's what Romans 1 says, you became fools professing yourself to be wise. So you with your smart self, stop listening to Holy Spirit that's supposed to be living inside of you and start listening to the you of you and end up in a place jacked up wondering how you got here. And there are some of us that have been seduced by our emotional moments and the thoughts and nine months later, mm, we living with what we never intended to birth out. You didn't marry what you never intended. Oh, man. And now you, watch this, now you miserable, but you blaming God for your decisions. So you got to stop denying God with your thought process. Come on. So he says, in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled, fully met in us who did not live according to the flesh but according to the spirit. Come on. Those who live, now watch this, they ain't talking about us. Those who live according to the flesh have the mind set on what? On flesh desires. So whenever you get caught up in your flesh, your flesh ain't thinking about nothing but flesh. But those of us who live in accordance with the spirits have our mind set on what the spirit desires. Not what we desire, but what the spirit of God desires for us. Because you got to come to an understanding that God wants better for me than I could ever want for myself. I know what I'm doing. Jeremiah 29 29 and 11. He says what? I know the thoughts that I think towards you. Those thoughts are good, not evil. To do what? bring you to an expected end. So God has already thought out in his mind from the beginning to the end what is good concerning you. And then he tries to download it to you, but you're so caught up in your fleshly desires oh, based upon what you've seen. Mm. Oh. Ah. Yeah. Okay. So now watch this. That's why the Bible tells you what? You got to be careful of your eye gate, what you allow yourself to what? See. Because it shapes how you think. And then it, it what? It impacts what you do. I have to be careful of what? What I allow myself to see because it shapes how I think and then what? It affects what I do. So watch this. Here, 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 here's the thing. Here's the thing. And, and yeah, I just see some kids in here, but I can just use proper terminology. There's a reason why we have to abstain from pornography, even as married couples, because it shapes what we think. So now this wonderful gift of lovemaking that God himself instituted and gave to those of us that were married, man and woman, that were married, that God gave to us, ordained, Hebrews 13 and 4 says, marriage is honorable and the bed undefiled. So God has ordained sexual relations between a husband and a wife. God has ordained it. Now watch this. We take that beautiful thing that God's given us. In pornography, this thing is skewed and, 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 and I mean just becomes something that's woo. But now this thing that we are watching starts to shape how we see what God has said 
And now we got all these false expectations. Fellas, she ain't hanging off the chandelier with one leg right here and the other one over there. Uh, Stop watching. There's a reason it's called a movie. Because movies are full of actors and actresses. Don't nobody like that. It's a movie. They get paid to do that. Stop letting that thing warp your image. Ladies, it's a movie. No, he ain't an hour long. No, it's a movie. Somebody doing the way said, cut, take a break, get some Gatorade. Get a stand. Where the stunt double at? It's a movie. It cannot shape your perception of what is real. That ain't what God ordained. Look at that me all night. No, I'm going to sleep. I don't know what nobody else doing. But oops, my bad. My my. But no, you you then took what God has determined to be righteous and skewed it in a wicked imagination. And now it's shaping your thought. Now you mad at her because she don't look like, well, she ain't look like that when you murder. She... If you buy her some, hers will be that firm, that big, that wide, that long, that tall. No, man. You done fell in love with some Lee Press on. (laughs) Trying to help somebody. Stop it. You're creating, watch this, a wicked imagination. And then you're denying what God has ordained to be real. Ooh. Mm, mm, mm. Where we at? So... I don't even know if we're going to get in them. He says the mind governed by flesh is what? The mind governed by flesh is death. He's everything, everything. The Proverbs tell you what? There is a way that seems right. So when I start processing myself out, my, out of myself, I'm in that way that what? Seems right. It feels, how do you even judge it? Come on, let's be honest. When you make a decision, how you judge it? I judge it based on how I feel. And if it makes me feel good, then it must be all that's why the book said there's a way that what? Seems right. You can't judge a thing honestly unless you step out of it and allow God to step into it. Because God will judge it with an honest way. You, you and your wicked self, come on, man. You will skew the game up every time. Come on. You will cheat every time. If ain't nobody looking, you'll put your feet on the scale to make it turn in your favor. You'll do whatever you got to do to justify what you really want. He says anytime you start doing this stuff out of your flesh, it's going to take you to a dead place a dead situation and dead circumstances and as soon as you get in that dead place now you want to call on God now I need the living God why you ain't need God before you made all them jacked up decisions to get your butt broke busted and this now you want everybody to pray with you all night long now you think you now you think you got a right to infringe upon other people's life to help you get out of the mess that you ain't asked nobody about before you got there the book says in the multitude of counsel there is safety you should have asked somebody that had more sense than you to tell you go sit your stupid hind pots down that don't make no sense But you look for the very person that's functioning on the same level of ignorance that you, and ignorance is not a bad word, that's functioning on the same level of ignorance that you are to confirm you in what you want to do. Because men love darkness because their deeds. Mm. Jesus. Y'all all all right? Man, so watch we, we keep jacking ourselves up and denying the power of God to work in our life because I want to do what I want to do. And, and you find songs, if it feel good to you. you what, whatever, you find music, you find people, anything that what? Justifies you and how you want to feel. Child, don't let nobody tell you how you feel. You, you better let somebody tell you something. No. No, no, for real. I ain't trying to be funny. You better let somebody tell you something. You better find a role model that's doing something, that's living right, that's living at the... And then I don't understand. Y'all just let... Can I just talk? Yeah, I don't understand because you keep saying how you want to live. You got all these pictures of your house and and all your imagination. Because, you know, 
We are building in our spiritual imagination. I'm just building it. I'm building my vision board. I'm building it in my faith, child. I'm building this in my faith. I see myself doing this, and then ain't no follow-through. You can put the biggest picture of the biggest house on, your, on the biggest wall in your house, but if your credit jacked up and you try to go to the bank, they ain't giving you no... No, because watch this. There's your imagination, and then there's the truth. Now, when God deals in your imagination, God deals in your imagination in the spirit of truth. God begins to show you what he intends for you, but then he tells you, you got to go do some work. Because my faith is akin to a work. Oh, man. My, my faith is akin, it, it's kindred to a work. I can't even talk about having faith if I ain't willing to do no, because faith without some work is, the book says, if you read it, I believe it, it's even the message of the Amplifier. I think it's the message. It says that faith and work go together like a hand and a glove. We ain't talking about OJ trying to get his hand in that little glove. We talking about that glove that's made just for you. If you don't put no work in, you can talk about all the faith you want. So let me let me get through here. Where I'm at? Come on. Flesh is hostile. Oh, oh, hold on. It says, watch this. The mind that's governed by flesh is what? Is what? Is what? Is hostile to God. And, 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 and King James, it says, intimate. I looked that word up. It says, to, it means to be a hater of God. It says that the mind that's subjected to his carnality is a hater of God. It says, so this mindset is hostile to God, does not what? Refuses to submit to God's law, nor can it do it. So as long as I stay in my carnal mindset, there is no way that I can become submissive to the law. In other words, I can't fall up under the influence of what God is saying as long as I stay up under the influence of my flesh. So as long as my flesh is, is, is manipulating me, there is no way in the world I can move to a place where God's spirit is motivating me. As long as I'm being manipulated by my flesh, there is no way I'll be motivated by the spirit of God. So, so I can't, I can't, it says you can't do it. You can't do it. Even if you wanted to do it, you can't do it. As long as you stay subject to yourself, there is no way you can be subject to the power of God. Come on. Let me, let, let me, let me get out. So those who are in the realm of the flesh, those of us that are trying to do things, operate out of flesh, it says what we produce Again, it's not going to be pleasing to God. Why? Because my, my flesh is a kindred to this world. It's submitted to this world. It's attached to this world. It's subject to this world. My flesh is. My carnality here is this world. It responds to this world. Come on, man. Tell the truth. You're more, respon you more responsive to the things that happen than you are to the things that are in heaven. Because when we see something happen, we forget all about what heaven said about it, and we start responding to what is happening. Why? Because our flesh is attached to this world. It appears to us. We can see it. We can feel it. We can hear it. So we immediately respond to it. But it, we never stop to take that step back to hear what heaven is saying about what we see in. So you'll fall right in line saying what everybody else is saying, doing what everybody else is doing without ever considering what heaven has said. Mm. Woo. <laughs> Watch this. Romans 4. Take me to Romans 4. Y'all don't have to go on the website. We ain't getting through all these scriptures. Where we at? We coming? Come on. Yeah. So watch this. Romans 4 and 22, we, we talking about Abram. Because whenever you start dealing with your rights versus your righteousness, you know that your carnality, when I'm dealing with myself, 
it always deals or it always connects with my flesh. That's not how God intended. That's not how God responds or operates in you, with you. So watch this. Romans 4 and 22 says this. This is God dealing with Abram. Now watch this. Abram, nah, no, that'll open up a whole nother discussion. So I ain't even going to go there. I'm going to use some temperance. Abraham is talking about his faith, him believing God, no matter the promise of God. Uh, Romans 4 chapter, you know, God has made promise of uh, 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 Isaac, and, and he ain't showed up yet. And him and Sarah is old, but he's still talking about his hope for, his belief in. Now watch, because he maintained his righteous position of faith in God, believing what God says over what he saw, because the book says that he didn't even consider the deadness of Sarah's womb. It says this in 22. It says this is why it was a credit to him as righteousness. God found him righteous. Come on, Ty. So the, word, the words, it was a credit to him, were written not, alone, not for him alone. Come on but for us also. So it's not even God's talking about how he deal with Abraham as long as Abraham, I mean, because Abraham stayed in faith, but he's talking about us. As long as we stay in faith, as we are submitted to the word of God versus what we see, he says it's the same thing towards us, but for also for us whom God will credit righteousness for us who believe in him. What? God will credit me righteousness towards me, not impute my sins or allow me to be influenced by my carnality as long as I believe in him. Now, believing in him or believing means what? I got to constantly convince myself that that four stated statement is true. So I got to constantly convince myself that whatever God is saying about me, whatever God is saying about my circumstances, whatever God has said about my situation, it is the truth not taking in consideration what I see, where I am, what I'm going through, how it feels, how it smells, how it sounds, or how it tastes. So I got to supersede my five senses. Where? In the kingdom. In the kingdom. Are y'all with me? So he says, for, for, for us who believe in him, who raised Jesus, our Lord, from the dead. All right. Then if we go to Romans 5 and 1, and we, we don't have to go. Romans 5 and 1 says this, that now because we believe, now God justifies us by faith. Romans 6, the next chapter we would go to, 6 and 2 says this. He says, don't you know that you have been what? You've been buried, you've been baptized in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. Now you can get up and walk in a new life. Now you can start functioning in the newness of your mind. Why? Because you have allowed yourself to become submitted, submerged in, in the leading of the righteousness of God and not trying to live by your rights. I've surrendered my rights for his righteousness, and because of that, God says I can function out of a new mindset. So now I can embrace Romans 12, 1 and 2, where it tells me what? To present my body a living sacrifice that is holy and acceptable unto God, knowing that this is my reasonable service and being transformed or not conforming to the world of this world, but being transformed, how? By the renewing of my mind. So somewhere up in here, if, if you're going to live at the rate that God wants you to, you can go back, Ty. You got to learn how to lose your mind. You got to learn how to let go of your mind and embrace the mind of God. That's why Philippians 2 uh, Philippians 2, if you read verses 1 through 5, you start hearing this discourse with Paul. And I always read this and, and I always made emphasis on verse 5 where it says, Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. Also in Christ Jesus. Also in Christ Jesus. And I'm always thinking that this is talking about Christ. Really, when you read the discourse, it's talking about Paul, who had the mind of Christ, telling us that this is the way that we should be also, like he was. Paul is telling us that we ought to function in the same mindset that he was functioning in, which was the mind that was in Christ also, who thought it not robbery to count himself equal with God, but who became, made him own self a servant and became obedient even into the death of the cross. Are you with me? So Paul says this is doable because I've done it the same as Christ. 
Oh, so it's not impossible for me to take on the mind of God. So now you got to take away that excuse that I can't live like that. Mm. Only Jesus could. No, that's not true because Paul just testified that this is the mind that was in him. That was also in Christ Jesus. So if Paul could do it, you can do it. How am I going to do it? Well, now I got to allow, allow Holy Spirit to rise up in me. Oh, boy. I said I got to allow Holy Spirit to rise up in me. Why? Because Romans 8, 16 and 17 talks about this is the Spirit of God that bears witness to us and declares us to be what? Sons and daughters of the Most High God. And if sons and daughters join heirs with Jesus Christ. Hold on. Whatever was functioning in Jesus Christ is the same Spirit of God that's functioning in me. That the same Spirit of God that was functioning in Paul. And if Paul can live with a renewed mind, so can I. And it doesn't matter what thoughts show up. I'm still, watch this, I'm still the ruler of this kingdom. I might can't control what show up, but I sure can control how long it stays and what impacts it makes. We all right? Woo, hallelujah. Mm, mm, mm. So here, here. Ephesians 5 and 1. Watch this. Ephesians 5 and 1 says, because I've submitted myself. Take me there, Todd. Can you get me? Can you get that right quick? Ephesians 5 and 1. Talks about this. It simply says that because I've submitted myself, I've relinquished my rights. I've stopped denying God with my thoughts and allowed the thoughts of God to become, watch this, the ruler of my kingdom. Man, you got to get this. Do you believe you can think like God? No, seriously. Then if you believe you can think like God, then why do you spend so much time thinking like you? Because you got you to gotta weigh that thing. If I can think like God, then when I judge and I look at my life, if I look at where I am, how I'm processing, how I'm responding, how am I doing, who am I thinking like? Truth is, most of us respond from the, from the culture that we came from. So whatever whatever it was the culture in your house how to respond, that's how you respond. Sometimes you hollering at, at the children simply because your mama told y'all my aunt, man, but God bless her and let her rest in peace. My aunt was, I don't know, she, I ain't gonna call her crazy. I just didn't understand why my drawers, my dresser drawers, were so important to her. Nobody could see what was in them. So nobody knew if my clothes were balled up or folded up. You, you couldn't see if my underwear were color coordinated or not. Or if my underwear and my socks were in the same. But she would flip out. And I've been about I hate her. I hate her. I hate her. <laughs> Close the door because you couldn't say nothing because you get that. And why you always do that in the mirror? Okay. See, I see I ain't the only one. I ain't the only one been in the bathroom with the door closed. You watching yourself cry, you just So now some of y'all children in the bathroom talking about some. I don't know why. She used to freak out about my dresses. So I come home, man, and all my clothes be dumped in the middle of the floor. The drawers be thrown on the bed, on the bed, and she looking at me like, clean it up. And I'm thinking, I didn't make that mess. I had everything neatly balled up in the drawer. No. So whatever her issue was became my issue. It was cultural. So now I'm finding myself, you know, one day I'm in there and I'm in Nene, Aisha, and Josh's room, and I'm in their drawers and their clothes are balled up. 
and I'm going off. I'm throwing clothes on. And I'm thinking to myself, they're going to clean this mess up. There ain't no clothes in that drawer like that. And, I, 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 and that thing dawned on me just as, like, you said you couldn't stand that. So why you, I says, why are you, why you projecting that on your children? Because all you're going to make them do is go in the bathroom, close the door and say, And the truth is, we don't want our children to hate us. We want our children to love us and to feel that they can come to us with what? Anything. But I never felt that way. Watch this. I never felt that way because of how you treated me about some dresser drawers. So I wouldn't bring you any other problem. Come on, man. You got you to gotta watch this. It, it seemed like something simple to you, but what you're doing is building a monument in them. And did it really matter? It didn't matter if the, my clothes still ain't folded up. And the problem why they not folded up is I'm getting back at her. I ain't folding up nothing. I, and I don't, watch this, I do not like to fold clothes, pass the K fold clothes. Because I don't want to fold clothes. I don't want to neatly put them in the drawer. So a lot of times she does. You open my sock drawer, you liable to get hit by all kinds of socks because I just stuff as many paying there and you pull that. Yeah. My response to you is stay out of because they are it's not they. I understand the chaotic. No, you, 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 I, it's chaos to you. There is a functioning order for me. Amen, somebody. <laughs> Look at Brother Bo. See, <laughs> he got creases in his underwear. They starched and color coordinated his socks. Salute. That's why I ain't going to the military. They had to kick my butt out there. Oh, boy, you got them whites with them. Get on. So watch this. Watch this. We, we got to be careful, right? That, that we're not allowing our culture to rule our mind and to govern our behaviors. You can't fall prey to your own emotions and your own imagination because the enemy will use it against you. You can't, watch this, let me, let me help you. You can't look at the function and flow of somebody else's house and think that stuff gonna work in your house. So you, you, watch, you can look and study and borrow and then watch, make it fit your house but you can't take that model of their house, think I'm going to bring this home. No. Try some of that crazy stuff, and I found out, man, I'm married to a short black lady. Like, that ain't, she ain't respond like that on TV. This ain't. <laughs> so you find out real quick that that, that, oh, that, that, scratch that off, that don't work. That does not work. So you have to be careful. So here, here's what Paul says to us in Ephesians 1. He says, follow what? God's example. He says, in everything you're doing, God has set an example. In John, the first chapter, the 14th verse, it says us this, that the word was made flesh and it dwelt among men. Jesus came to be the example. In, in Ephesians, when he starts, I think it's, it's, yeah, it's Ephesians 5, about verses 21, 22. You don't have to move. He starts talking about the husband's role in his house and that you're the, you're the leader of your house. He's literally saying that you're the example of your house and that your house is going to follow your example. Whether it be a good example or a poor example, your house is going to look just like you. Why? Because that's the authority that's been placed upon you to be the example. You ain't got to beat your chest. You ain't got to scream and holler. All you got to do is lead. So he says, follow the example Therefore, as dearly who loved children, sons and daughters. Remember, Romans has already declared you to be what? Sons and daughters of the Most High God. So there's no way we can say we can't do it because when God declared us to be sons and daughters, he gave us the ability to do it. So now I can't allow anybody to place thoughts in my mind that tells me I cannot think like God. Isaiah 55 uh, verses 7 and 8 says that if I'm wicked, I got to let go of my wicked ways and my unrighteous thoughts, and I will return unto God. 
who will pardon me. So anytime I get out, I'm out in my thoughts and in my processes. All I got to do is repent, return unto God. He will give me back, he'll purge me, wash me clean, whatever you want to say. He'll, he, he'll clean you up, get you back in your right place, in your right proper position so you can follow the example. And all you have to do is learn how to deny yourself. Empty yourself. Allow the thought, the process, the mind of God to become prevalent in you. It it will guide, guide you and lead you into all truths. Here to sit down. That's why... Jeremiah, I mean, yeah, Jeremiah 33 and 3. You need to hold on to that. God, God's mind is so linked with mine. Remember in Genesis 3, after they sinned, what happened? After they sinned, they, a, 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 after they sinned, what happened? Yeah, there was a whole bunch of shame, condemnation, and all that, but that was attached to their flesh. God still showed up looking for them. You ever read that? That it's after they've sinned. Genesis 3. It's after they sin that God, the voice of God, still shows up looking for them in the cool of the day. Why? That was their thing. That was a moment of revelation. That's what God, watch this, mind to mind. There was a link. They walked, they revelated. They walked, they revelated. That's why it was easy for Adam to name the animals. Why? God, revelation. Jesus says this, I always do. Always do. Always do what's pleasing to him who has sent me. In other words, I don't have no thought, I don't have no will of my own. My thoughts and wills are to be pleasing to the one that sent me. When? Always. See, if you get kingdom-minded, your opinion don't matter. You don't even have to argue about stuff. What you think about this, what the word say about it. I only think what the word thinks. I have no opinion. My football coach used to say, opinions like, everybody got one. That way he he used to say, opinions like, yeah, yeah, fill in the gap. He said, everybody. And then you couldn't tell him what you thought if you messed up. Why you do that? I thought. I thought took a crap and died. I still ain't figured out that one, but that was his answer to what your thoughts were. And the only thing I could come back to is he didn't give a crap about what you thought. All the thing he wanted you to do was what he said. Uh, uh, see, see, when you get that revelation, from, see, God really don't really care about what you think. All he really wants you to do is comply to what he said. And if he said, if you comply, if you be willing and obedient, God promised you would eat the good of the land. All that to say what? Why are you struggling to figure it out when God already got it? I was driving home, and for real, I'm finished. We, 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 we take, take to, the, uh, to the last couple of screens there. I was driving home uh, Friday night from hearing Dr. Mike. Man, I was fired up in the car, too. I was preaching this sermon. I was preaching so loud to myself. Oh, Jesus, I need to pull over and just shout all by myself. Well, I said, I was driving. Because the new thing now is when you don't know something, what you do? Holy Spirit asked me, well, who told Google? Because we think everything that comes off Google to be what? The truth. Well, yeah, the question is, who told Google? That thing messed me up. Because we Google everything. Well, what if Google ain't saved? Who told Google? Because the information on Google is only relevant to the source that's providing Google which probably comes from somebody's opinion. Then he asked me this. He said the information on Google becomes historical the moment it's placed on Google. As soon as it gets on Google, it's already history. And he says you're depending 
on historical information to make your decision instead of kingdom revelation that knows the beginning from the end and the end from the beginning. And God says, what I'm trying to give you is not just your answers for today, but your answers for your tomorrow. And you stuck dealing with Google who can only tell you what happened yesterday. Went to see Tyler play soccer. I don't know nothing about soccer. We'll say he did good, but the truth is I have no idea. But I was cheering him on, though, you know. When I go see the volleyball, I'm a little more in tune to soccer. They just run around. I ain't still ain't figured out why they kick the ball so much down their own end near their own goal, but pray for a brother. But I did get a revelation and some understanding from my pastor. He said in soccer, he said in soccer, the objective is never to pass the ball where your man is. It's always to pass the ball to where your man is going. With God, he will never pass you the ball for where you are. But he'll always kick the ball ahead of you to where you are going. Because God has a destined place for each and every one of us to live a victorious life. So what do we do next? This is what I want you to do. Two things I want you to do this week. Come on, Ty. Spend time in prayer this week. That should be asking. I'm sorry. Asking God that the bond of Christ be fulfilled in you. So spend time. Spend time praying, talking to God to ensure that the mind of Christ is fulfilled in you. And then do this. Make up your mind that when old situations come up, that you will not respond to them in the same manner as before receiving the mind of Christ. So don't allow yourself to get bent out of place and, and to have emotional moments like you used to. Act like you got the mind of Christ functioning in you. And then meditate on this scripture. We're in Isaiah, the 43rd verse, 18 through 20, and this is out of the Common English Bible. It says this. It says, don't remember the prior things. Don't ponder ancient history. Look, I'm doing a new thing. Now it sprouts up. Don't you recognize it? I'm making a way in the desert. I need my glass. Oh, they right there. Passage in the wilderness. The beasts of the field, the jackals and the ostriches will honor me because I have put water in the deserts and streams in the wilderness to give water to my people, to my people, my chosen ones. Don't go back to old ways of being. Don't allow your emotions to take you back to an old place that God has already brought you out of. Even in the midst of what seems to be the most intense bearing times, God says, behold, I'll do a new thing. So, commit <laughs> to come back next Sunday and bring a friend.